Okay, so last week we started with the generation of Noah's sons, the record written by the survivors of the flood. Remember I said different individuals, okay, before the flood were writing the record of their lives and things that had happened and so on and so forth. And so the survivors of the flood, they wrote about the flood and we have their record. And that's what we're reading in Genesis. They confirm that 120 years after God's final warning to man that if he didn't repent, he would destroy them. Um, and uh, as we fast forward through the 120 years, we find out that man is still wicked, still unrepentant. So in the next section, the writers describe the terrible judgment that came upon the world and give us a close-up view of how their father Noah prepared for the catastrophic flood that was to take place. Remember I told you the different views that you have, you know, close-up view, panoramic view, and then the subplots, you know, the, seat of, the seat of Satan, the seat of the woman, you know, and then the, the struggle between those two, those two subplots always kind of you know, intertwined in the, uh, in the narrative. So it's interesting to note that the Bible record has provided us with specific details of the way these people were saved. And so that's what we read about in chapter six, verses 14 to 16. Let's read, it says, so now God is talking to Noah, okay, at this part. He says, make uh, for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and out with pitch this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top and set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. So these verses here not only give a picture of the physical dimensions of the vessel that Noah was to build, but it also announces how God is going to carry out His promise to destroy the world. Remember now, we're looking at this from hindsight. You know, we're looking back at what happened, but until now, God has not revealed how He's going to punish man. But now He does. Up until this time, we don't know how the world is going to be destroyed, but now we do. So some interesting statistics on the ark itself. I'm just so amazed that you know, in antiquity, so long ago, that God preserved some of these details. You know, they're kind of tantalizing when you see them. All right? So some, some statistics about the ark itself. First of all, the term ark simply means a box. That's all it means, a box. And it is the same word used for the basket in which Moses was placed when he was a baby. Same word, okay? He was placed in a, an ark, a box. Uh, a different word is used for the Ark of the Covenant. We use that word, right? The Ark of the Covenant. The word used for Ark of the Covenant meant to gather or a kind of a chest or a coffin, all right? Not the same word. Uh, another fact, uh, in modern measurements, conserv uh, conservative estimate, would put the Ark at 438 feet long, 73 feet wide, and 44 feet high. So to get a visual of that, that's about a football and a half a field, a football field and a half long uh, and four stories high. So we're, we're, talking about a, we're talking about a pretty, pretty large structure here. Another thing that's interesting is that it was impossible to tip over the way that it was built. Uh, the ark was not built for speed. It wasn't even built for direction. It didn't have sails. Notice there was no rudder, right? No sails, no rudder. It was simply a floating box. That's what it was with a cover on top of it. However, it was nearly impossible to tip over and sink. So a vessel this size and shape could be tilted to any angle short of 90 degrees and still be able to right itself. And of course, that was the right design, right, for what was going to take place. This was important, of course, given the nature of the disaster, as we said, that was going to take place. Um, over a million and a half uh, cubic feet of space, a box this side could contain, um, uh, as I say, one, one million four hundred thousand uh, 
cubic feet of space. And I don't know who, uh, who figured out these, uh, these dimensions here, but uh, this would be equivalent to 522 stock cars on a train. That's a pretty long train. Or it would be, and this is the part, whoever figured this out, but it could also hold 125,000 sheep. <laughs> yeah, whatever, you know, so. It just gives you an idea of how much livestock that could be carried in something like that. But who would want 125,000 sheep? That's a lot of wool. Um, it was multi-story. It had three stories with each one divided into different rooms or stables for animals. The construction material, we don't actually know what gopher wood is. It says gopher wood, but you know, we don't know what gopher wood is. Probably some kind of dense kind of wood you know, that would be needed to, for that type of a vessel. Pitch is not the name of a material. The word in the Hebrew simply means to cover, to cover. So it's the same word actually used for um, atonement. When you read about, the word, uh, about atonement, to make atonement, same word, pitch, is used here, pitch. So we don't know its exact composition either, only that wood was covered with some kind of wood resistant material. And then of course there's the mention of the windows and the door. The term for window in Hebrew is literally opening for light. We're not talking about glass here, we're talking about simply opening for light. The term in the Hebrew suggests several openings around the ark to let in light and air. There was, however, only one door by which the people and the animals would enter and then leave. So this construction must have seemed strange to the people of this era because they had never seen rain. They had never experienced a flood. Remember, this is still before the flood. The creation is still pristine. They had never seen anything like that. And this tremendous construction was being built where there was no water. I mean, once it was complete, it must have seemed ridiculous. I mean, there was no way to get it to the water. Anybody remember the book uh, Robinson Crusoe? The guy who's, you know, the man uh, you know, stranded on, the, on an island, you know? Remember the first time he, he spends all the time building a canoe you know, and he cut down logs and I don't know how many years he spent building it and he realized it was way too heavy. He couldn't carry it to the ocean. Well, same idea. You know, this thing was way too, you know, it wasn't even close to the water. It was too big to be useful. No sails, no rudder to steer it. It was only built for one thing and that was to protect against a flood. But a flood, nobody knew what a flood was. Why? Well, because the earth was irrigated, was, was, uh, 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 was watered through mist and underground, uh, underground rivers at the time. So to the unbelievers, the ark was a useless, irrelevant box in the middle of nowhere. But to those who believed, it was the way of salvation. It was the way that their life, their lives, we're going to be saved. We'll come back to that after and see there's a great parallel there. So now we look at God's judgment and promise to Noah in verses 17 to 22. We see God describing what judgment He's going to be bringing on the world for its sinfulness. So we read verse 17, He says, Behold I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven, everything that is on the earth shall perish. So one thing we notice about this is that God is the one who's bringing the judgment. It's not a, an act of nature that is attributed to God. You know, like, well, God let this happen. No, God is saying, I purposefully am going to do this, okay? Uh, God Himself, is going to be acting against man through natural forms. You know, I think sometimes if God can act through natural forms in judgment to mankind some thousands, several thousand years ago, can He do the same thing today? Yeah, yeah I think so. 
There's no law written anywhere that says that God would never again use you know, natural forces to kind of uh, influence man, send him a message. You know, Sodom and Gomorrah, they got a message, didn't they? So we need to think about that. We, we shouldn't discount too quickly sometimes some of the natural things that, that we, just, you know, we just chalk off to, well, that's just, quote, mother nature. You know? God controls and still controls what we call or what many call the environment. Now another uh, thing we need to look at is um, it says the flood of waters. When he says, I will send the flood of waters. Uh, this is the Hebrew words mabul mayim. The word for flood, I think it's here, there we go. Mabul mayim, that's in the Old Testament. The word for flood is mabul this word is only used to describe this category. And the reason I say that, a lot of people say, well, you know, a lot of floods happened in those days. This is just another flood. But the Hebrew writer, or the words that are used, selected by the Holy Spirit, he only uses one particular word to describe this catastrophe. Other floods or water disturbances are described using other words. So this word literally means destruction and is not used anywhere else other than in Psalm 29.10 where it is describing practically the same thing. I'm making a point here. The point is even the word that is used to describe this flood is very particular. Okay? Even in the New Testament, when the great flood is mentioned, the Greek word that is used is kataklysmos, which means cataclysm, denoting the immensity of the flood. So the Bible is very particular about explaining this particular event. It actually uses a very special word to describe it. In other words, it wasn't just any flood, it wasn't just the Nile overflowing its banks, it wasn't just some sort of regional water disaster that took place, it was a cataclysm, a once in history making event. You know when they say there was a, a once in a hundred year hailstorm? That in Oklahoma happens every spring, but you know what I mean? They say once in a hundred year, hailstorm or a once in a 500 year flood or something like that. Well, the Bible's making this point here that this was a once forever event. Now I say all of this because a lot of people today claim that the flood was just a regional flood that ancient writers embellished into a worldwide flood for the sake of a story. And you have a lot of Bible scholars or theologians or preachers or whatever try to explain away the flood that is mentioned in the Bible by simply saying, well, a lot of, you know, a lot of ancient people in their writings, they talk about a flood that they had in their area. So we have what they call flood narratives. We have lots of flood narratives in all kinds of different people in different countries and, they, and the conclusion they come to is, so there wasn't a great flood, there was just a lot of little floods that different countries wrote about. And so I say, are you actually hearing what you've just said? <laughs> you've got people in all kinds of different situations having records of a great flood that took place. What's the conclusion? They're all writing about the same thing. The, the, the flood that the Bible talks about as a cataclysm. All right, another thing, um, the flood or the destruction will destroy all that is, uh, well, th this is what the passage says. We're still talking about this passage where, where God is talking to Noah about the flood. He says he's going to destroy all that has the breath of life. And this includes mankind and animal life, but of course not marine life. Again, the Bible establishes the fact of complete worldwide destruction and not just a localized flood. And when we talk about the flood itself, a little later on, you know, next week, I think, the week after, we're going to see you know, the effect of the worldwide flood on the earth. All right, be interesting to see how it destroyed everything. 
So if it's not a worldwide flood, we have trouble explaining so much evidence that one did occur. We can't explain away some of the phenomena you know, by saying, oh, that was a regional flood. No, only a worldwide flood could have caused some of the things that we're even discovering to this day. All right, so let's keep going, verse 18. Again, God talking to Noah about the, um, about the uh, great flood that will take place. He says, but I will establish my covenant with you and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. So here we see the promise that God makes to Noah. This is the first time that the word covenant appears in the Bible. Up until this time, this word has not appeared in the Bible. Now the idea of a covenant is different than the idea of an agreement. I hear people say that all, all the time. A covenant is like an agreement. It's not. The two are very different. Very different things. Let me show you why. An agreement, when you have an agreement, both parties contribute to the details or the conditions of the contract. In any, a marriage contract, there, you know, you have two names, you have witnesses, you have promises that you're going to make. Any contract that you make, two people are negotiating. And what you agree on and what you hold yourself liable for, you put into the, into the contract. Uh, in a contract, either party can, under certain conditions, opt out of the contract. If certain conditions aren't met, you know, we say, well, you know, then the contract is off, the purchase is off. You know, I agree to buy such and such after I, I, I agree to buy the car, for example, for so much money, so on and so forth, on the condition that I have it checked by my mechanic and he gives it a, you know, a clean bill. So you have an opt-out opt clause in a contract. Um, it takes the agreement of both parties to put the contract into effect. Both people have to sign. If only one person signs, you don't have a contract, you don't have an agreement. Um, contracts usually benefit both people. Who would sign a contract that would you know, go against themselves? So usually, you know, everybody gets something out of a contract. Uh, it's also used to guarantee fairness and honesty. We promise to do certain something, we, we uh, agree to buy something, whatever. You know, we have a written contract so that people don't cheat. They cheat anyways, but you know, we're hoping. I remember there was a lawyer once, I was, this was before I became a minister, I was in business with a guy, and we went to see a lawyer, and I was buying 10% of the company that was going to be mine. He had 90% of the company, but we were going to be partners. And you know, it was a long, drawn-up contract, pages and pages, and we went to see a lawyer, an older gentleman. He had been in the law for a long, long time. And so we've, we signed all the papers and all that kind of stuff. And then he said, do you mind if I give you gentlemen uh, some advice? And I said, sure, of course. You know. uh, he said, just remember that this contract is not worth more than your goodwill. Because if there's not goodwill, then either one of you will find a way out of this contract. So usually a contract is there, you know, there has to be goodwill and fairness, something that both parties will get. And then finally, a contract can be annulled, again, for certain conditions. So that's what a contract or an agreement is. In a covenant, very different. In a covenant with God, God is the one that establishes all the conditions in the covenant. We, we have nothing, we don't put anything down in the covenant. He puts everything in the covenant. In a covenant with God, God never opts out of the covenant. He honors the covenant no matter what man does. In the covenant, the covenant exists and is in force on God's word. In other words, in a contract you both sign under law, there are penalties, so on and so forth, the law, you know, the law uh, 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 supports the contract, if you break the contract and cheat, you can go to jail, you know, that type of thing. But the thing that sustains a covenant is God's word, because God cannot lie. If He says this is what's going to happen, 
this is what's going to happen. Now a lot of times we see that negatively. We see that, oh, if God said He's going to punish us, boy, He's going to punish us. You know, we, we tend to see things negatively because we're sinners, right? But try to look on the positive side. If God says, I want you to go to heaven and I'm going to do everything in my power to get you to heaven, isn't that encouraging? It's like, you know, if God is on your side, you know, who can be against you? Who's going to trip you up if God is on your side? That's the great thing about the covenant. In the covenant that God has with us, He, he wants us to be saved. He wants us to go to heaven. And the purpose of a covenant is not to benefit God, it's to benefit man. In a contract, both people got to get something out of it. In a covenant, we're the ones that get something out of it. A covenant is not only perfectly just and fair, it is usually the way that God extends grace and mercy to man because man does not deserve grace and mercy. God makes special provision to assure that man receives mercy by creating these covenants. In other words, if God didn't make a covenant with us, we wouldn't get anything. It's like your kids at Christmas time. You know, when they're little, I remember my mother, you know, uh, when I was a little boy, you know, uh, five, six, something like that, old enough to be aware that I, I was getting gifts, but old enough to be aware that I, you know, I would like to give a gift, you know, but I had no money, I was five, you know, whatever. And she would give me a few dollars, you know, and, or my dad would give me money so I could buy my mom a present. I remember going to the pharmacy, whoa, you know, and uh, buying her, anybody remember desert flower? You know, that, there was this perfume, I mean, I swear, it was, it was like this for three dollars, you know, <laughs> three dollars. And the thing that captured my imagination is that there was a plastic flower at the bottom of the perfume bottle. You know, I figured this is, this is top-notch stuff here, you know. So the pharmacist, you know, he wraps it and he puts it in a bag, you know, and I get to wrap it and I give it to my mom, you know. What did I provide here? Nothing. My dad gave me the money so that I could give to my mother a, a gift. It's the same thing, you know. God gives us everything so we can give him back something. We don't, we don't have anything to give him. It's the same idea. A little, a little uh, um, after story on the perfume. So I gave her the perfume and I, and I remember, you know, like the following year, you know, it, 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 was, it wasn't going down very quickly. I said, Mom, I said, You're, do you like, the, oh, I love the perfume, but she says, it's special. <laughs> it's special. I said, oh, okay. So my mother must have recognized that I was sensitive to the idea that she wasn't using the perfume, you know. So as time went on, one day, you know, I, I don't know, I, I walked in and she was cleaning the bathroom and I saw her using it as disinfectant. <laughs> so, you know, that was, that was the end of the desert flower for, for mom and for me. So, you know, all this, all this kind of to say that we're like children with our Father God. We're, we're children. We don't have anything to give Him. He gives us everything so that we can give Him something back. It's kind of the same way. And the covenant is what guarantees that we have something to give. He makes the covenant, makes the rules, gives us something, we give it to Him. The covenant guarantees that for everything. And then one other thing, a covenant with God cannot be dissolved by man or by mutual agreement. God always finds a way to honor His covenants even when man wants to dissolve the covenant. Same idea, sometimes we say, oh God, you know, I'm not good enough, you know, go away from me. You know. You know, he won't let us go. He continues to pursue us always. And so God makes a covenant with Noah. It will be elaborated when the flood is over and God will describe it in detail then. But for now, God invites Noah to enter into the covenant with him by building the ark and entering into it when the time comes. So let's read verses 19 to 21. It says, and of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark 
to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind, and of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing of the ground after its kind, two of every kind will come to you uh, to keep them alive. As for you, take for yourself some of all food which is edible and gather it to yourself, and it shall be for food for you and for them. So in the warning, God also provides information concerning the use of the ark and how the animals were to come to Him. Two of every species or kind in biblical terms probably covers a much wider uh, range uh, than the division of types that are used today. Uh, there are a lot who are skeptical about this, but it's all quite, all quite possible. I mean, most animals are, I know there are very large, some very large ones, but most animals are small, small in nature. Scientists estimate that there are approximately 18,000 species of mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians in the world today. Double this amount to account for extinct species, and there are approximately 40,000 species that we're talking about. Two of each brings you up to about 80,000 creatures. As I say, the ark, the size of it, could easily accommodate uh, this amount of, 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 of animals. Insects, about a million of them in types. They don't take a lot of room, no need to make special provision for marine life. Now, an, an important factor is that God is the one who brought the, animal, uh, the animals to Noah. He didn't have to go out and capture it. They came to, you see this sometimes in movies about Noah, you know, the animals just kind of streaming in uh, on their own. These uh, animals were under God's care and control and so their needs and temperament for such an experience could easily be controlled by God. God's controlling the whole process here. It's not as if you know, Noah had to understand what each animal ate and how they lived and on the first floor, on the bottom, you know, which animals to put next to. It doesn't say Noah had this special knowledge. Noah's job was simply to build the box. And building the box was the way that he was demonstrating his faith. God was taking care of the rest. Now, um, uh, the one who created them could sustain them while they were in the ark. I'm reminded of the Israelites, remember? And God says to the Israelites, while they were in the desert for 40 years, He says, your sandals didn't wear out, your clothes didn't wear out. You're in the desert. You had water, you had everything you needed, yet you were in the desert. You, you were more human beings in the desert being taken care of by God than there were animals on the ark, and yet God took care of you. So if God can take care of a couple of million people for 40 years in the desert, surely He can take care of you know, tens of thousands of animals on a boat for a year. I don't have trouble believing stuff like that. Some people say, oh, that just stretches me too. Really? That really stretches you. You mean the guy who said, let there be light, and there's like a couple of billion stars out there, in an instant, you know, you're having trouble believing that he can't get a few thousand animals on a boat? Really? Where's your faith? Verse 22, as always, we need to move now. Verse 22, should, should have chopped out the desert flower story. <laughs> In verse 22 it says, Thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. And so the record shows that Noah chose to enter into the covenant with God, and he did so how? By obeying God's command, by building the ark and preparing it for its year, uh, its year long voyage. All right, so next time we're going to look at the flood and its effect on the earth. I want to give a couple of lessons here, just two in particular, while we have a few minutes left. The story of the ark is full of types and lessons for us today. First of all, we have to understand that the ark is a type for the church. When I say a type, and when we're talking about Bible study, a type is a preview. So the ark is a preview for the church, okay? Um, it is the first preview or first type that we see in the Bible of the church. And there are a lot of similarities. For example, there's only one ark, well there's only one church. There is safety only in the ark. There is salvation only in the church. There is only one way into the ark, right? It's only one door. Well, there's only one way into the church, Jesus Christ. 
um, uh, those in the ark are alive through water. And those in the church are alive how? Through water. Baptism. Um, the ark carries them to the next life, the recreated life. And the church carries us to the new heavens and the new earth. Only believers are in the ark. Only believers are in the church. The ark was laughed at and seemed irrelevant before the flood. The church seems so irrelevant in our society. I mean, really. Do the heavy hitters, do the intelligentsia, do the Harvard types, do the media types, do the smart people on TV or who write books, do any of them take the church seriously? No. It's irrelevant, it's foolish, it's for simpletons. Well, they said the same thing about the ark. The ark was built by those who believed and obeyed God's promises. The church is built by those who believe and obey God's promises. God provided for those in the ark to build it and then to live in it. And then God provides for the establishing of His church and the preservation of His church through the catastrophes of this life. Notice, things are blowing up, things are happening, there's war, there's disease, there's this, there's that, there's all kinds of stuff going on out in the world, in our own lives. I'm sure each of us could talk about some catastrophe or some difficulty going on in their lives, and yet somehow, I mean, separately that's all happening, and yet when we come together, what are we? We're the church, we're still here, we're still hanging on, we're still standing. And then the ark was absolutely necessary because the flood did come. And the church is absolutely necessary because the judgment will surely come with Jesus' second coming. So the ark, the first lesson that I want to get across tonight is the ark is the first type or preview for the church. And then the second lesson is you need to be in the ark and you need to stay in the ark. The story is for us today to impress upon us the importance of the church and the fact that it is the vessel through which we will be saved when the next catastrophe occurs. And I guarantee you that if we read the Bible correctly, we can be absolutely sure that the next catastrophe will occur and there won't be any escaping it. There won't be any, oh, is it too late to apologize? Wait a minute, can I, you know. All right, so that's our lesson on the, the prepping the ark. Next week we're going to talk about the flood itself. Fascinating, you know, the effects of a worldwide flood on the earth itself and what it, what it, how it damaged the earth. Okay, thank you very much. That's it. <laughs>